Welcome to TLC for the Soul podcast, where soul meets spirit. You have entered into sacred space. I'm your host, Tammy Lynn Chambers, and I'm here to help you shine. Now let's get going on this podcast journey. Hello, friends. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This is day three of our mini healing retreat series, 777. Sevens are all about moving forward and higher enlightenment on your journey. If you're new here, settle in, but you may want to You can do these as standalones. I keep saying that, but if you really want the full experience moving through the entire seven day journey, which we're on day three, then I would suggest going back and starting at day one. I'm recording this on a Wednesday after Easter Sunday. So we're trying to get this whole 777 series in before the Taurus eclipse at the end of the month, end of April, 2022. But this is timeless. You can do this workshop whenever you feel guided. You can also kind of come back and forth to it at different times. I know many people do that. They kind of um, go in and out of the content on this show and on this channel as they're guided to. If you're returning to the show, I want to thank you so much yet again for being here with us. I actually get to record outside today. I was going to set up the camera and I'm like, oh, I'm just too exhausted to set up the camera. It was so busy over the Easter weekend and the past couple of days. And I just am like so tired. I didn't even want to get in front of the camera. Someone is riding a bike. So this is the first sunny day that I've been living in this new place. Um, It's probably in the 40s, maybe 50s. There are still no leaves on the trees. Like, I'm sorry, but (laughs) there has to be springtime. There has to be leaves. I'm going to have to go reprimand my dog. Get out of there. She's on a trail of something that she's trying to get. I'm going to throw something at her. But um, actually outside, there's still snow that hasn't melted yet. Get out of there. But it is sunny and pretty, and so I hope you can hear some of the nature sounds around. The sun is setting, so I'm looking out towards the west. I may post a picture. I may not as our thumbnail. First of all, though, I want to get us into sacred space for this day three mini healing. I was somewhat reticent to do it today because I'm like, this seems like it's going to be another kind of heavier concept. Um, But we'll just see. Maybe that's why I'm outside. So I want to wrap us all in love light and light love, inviting in the guides who overlight this show, Archangel Michael, Archangel Metatron, Pleiadians, and I have the Lyrans here. And why am I saying I think it's going to be a heavier show? Oh, let's see. Well, day one, we worked with in the root chakra, kind of grounding in all of the energies that this 777 retreat was going to encompass. Day two, we worked with the sacral chakra and healing some past life um, things that were holding us back from exploring our truths more fully, especially in relation to things that need to be said. Um, And there was a lot of light language that came through and a lot of clearing that was very deep. Um, And I didn't even feel like the next day I was like, I don't think I can do another show. Like I needed some integration time. And even the guides of this series were like, you're going to need at least a day integration time. Well, a day kind of turned into like, has it been four days? I don't even know how many days it's been. Uh, Four days or so in between of integrating this. And in between that, in between that was the Easter weekend, Good Friday and Easter Sunday and Compass. So all of the energies of those resurrection codes and all of that are part of this 777 series. It's all during the time that it's being created. But so today I knew 
It seems like we're working up the chakras, the energy body, and I knew we were going to be working with the solar plexus. I don't really prepare too much in advance, but I can say, you know, I just ask and set the intention that whatever needs to come through for everyone's highest and best good is what comes through in these shows. And yeah, we also had the full moon on Good Friday too as part of this. But why did I think it's a heavier concept? So we're working with my novel Powerball. We're using the up, I haven't even finished the darn thing yet, but I did channel in some more chapters. But um, we've been using the book Powerball as a workbook for this series. And it's also making me realize like, oh, gotta keep writing and finish the darn thing. So people can actually use it as a workbook if they want to. Um, but all of my books can be used as workbooks for healing in different ways. And all of my eBooks are free to read. Over on Smashwords is my eBook publisher. I've got all the links to all of that stuff like in the notes of this show or in the description of the show. But today, well, ever since, actually ever since Easter Sunday, I kind of got pulled into some higher learning concepts around the Ascension process, around, um, dragons and working with dragon ley lines and solar rishi dragons like I've been all up in um, trying to um, remember the codes that I have within me that have to do with um, higher light ascension process because what I remember from my own Akash and my own soul's lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and eons and eons and eons is are you stuck back there? You better not be. <laughs> is, I'm gonna spank this dog's butt. Get out of there. I never spank her, but I just always say that. Get out of there. Get out of there. Get out. She tries to get herself. Okay, this is, everything that happens during the show is part of this show. So she's trying to get herself into little tiny spaces that she's not supposed to get into. Mm -hmm, that's all right. And, Today, they had me really reading into the Draconian Wars, having to do with the fall of Lyra, which is very, I can't even talk about it, I get so emotional, uh, the feline races of Lyra and, all, and the royal family, and all of that is very near and dear to my personal journey. And for some of you as well, I think these deeper concepts are going to touch, again, some wounding, all right, thank you deep in your solar plexus that may be keeping you from standing fully in your power. I don't think it's going to be the same type of healing. I think the healing is actually going to be listening to what's being said here as part of the, the spiritual teaching rather than me bringing in light language, but we will see where I'm guided to. Okay, thank you. That's enough. I'm going to put her inside in a minute. The reason I thought that it might be a little bit heavier is because of the chapter of Powerball that we're being asked to work with. Let me go find it. Why does every show feature interruptions from one animal or person or another? I'm not sure. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. So when I intuitively chose the chapter for this show, I started rereading it because I channeled it a while back. Uh, before all this 777 workshop started. And I was kind of like, oh, okay. It has a lighthearted title and there's some lighthearted energy in it, but there's some deeper, darker stuff happening behind the scenes. And so I think for you to fully get the most out of this quest, this 777 quest to your own healing and your own being able to move forward on your path and on your journey, you need to invite in, well, you don't need to, but I would suggest getting comfortable and turning on your, your, your spiritual ears and eyes. I'm his eyes and ears. Why do I always get that from this show? It's a King of the Hill episode. I'm his eyes and ears. But turn on the, turn on your your spiritual eyes and ears to hear maybe what's not being said beneath the surface 
That way I'm not pointing, I am pointing out collective metaphors, but you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear your own things that also need to be heard or integrated in what maybe I'm not so much saying, but what you're getting out of the things that are being said on the show. So we are going to read this chapter. It's chapter nine. Um, I can't remember. Let's see. We started out with Grimelda Ravenclaw in the day one episode, and then we worked again with them on day two. I don't remember what we read. I can't even remember now. But this one is chapter nine. If the, fa- if the chapter numbers have any significance, that could be part of it as well. But this is called Fairies Wear Boots. And every time I hear that, I hear the, is it the, it's not Ozzy. Fairies Wear Boots is a, is it a Sabbath song? Anyway. <laughs> Let's just read. Hyperseth was the first to break the hold between them. He knew they needed to move from their location and get closer to the light world. But Magdalene looked exhausted, which is how I feel. She needed to rest before they tried to push free of the Badlands. It would be no good for them both if her magic was hindered by her need to rest. He used his hand to create an enclosure around them. It was an etheric structure made only of light and intention, but it would keep them safe and away from prying eyes while they rested. Hyperseth realized he hadn't taken a break in quite some time himself, and both of them lay down in the clearing of a small base of trees. He covered them both in pine needles and held her close as she napped. He was just about to drift into slumber himself when there was a sound of a twig cracking. Someone was mucking about, and in these woods one could never be too careful. He rose and unsheathed his sword from Tulane's saddlebags. Steady, old girl, he said, knowing that even a spirit horse could get spooked at times. The gilded steed was quick to temper, and Hyperseth didn't want her to give them away too soon. He readied himself by chanting a certain battle call that invoked his warrior guides around him, but he quickly realized that none of this circumstance was required when he heard a familiar old song. Well, it's my lord and lady coming through the shire. It's my lord and lady who I visit in this hour. Oh, rumbledy-dum, rumbledy-doo, it's time for us to meet. Oh, rumbledy-dum, rumbledy-doo, I'm standing at your feet. The song ended. (laughs) The dog is looking at me like I'm crazy. (laughs) I just did that voice. The song ended, and in a poof of dust, the old fay appeared in front of Hyperset. My magic still gets the best of you, old friend, the fairy of Madrigal, Linnaeus McGee said while tipping his hat and scuffing his top boots in the dirt. What are you doing here, Hyperseth said, putting down his sword and scooping up the old fay in a warm embrace. Are you here to bring more mischief about? Hyperseth wondered how he had been found out. And then it occurred to him, Linnaeus McGee had helped craft the power ball so many eons ago and so was plugged into its consciousness just as much as Hyperseth himself. No, old man, the smaller Fay said, holding something in his hand up to where Hyperseth could get a good look at it. I'm here to save you from a lick of trouble lest you walk straight through the barrier without anything as much as a goodbye and a howdy-do. Hyperseth was confused until the glint caught his eyes. It was the key that was used to connect the dark and the light. It was a wondrous force and a powerful ally and it would grant them passage into the light world without so much as a second glance. But how did you know we'd need that, Hyperseth wondered if Linnaeus had come alone. A little bird told me, Linnaeus said, feeling a small push from behind. Tell him he can have it for a price, the voice of Grimelda Ravenclaw said as she pushed dark magic up against him. Tell him or else, she said, pushing again. The pain of the dark magic too much for the old fae to bear made him squelch out a reply. You can only have the key if you surrender the Powerball, Linnaeus said, wincing in disgust at the trickery that had gone into this subterfuge. Then and only then, he said, hoping the dark pain in his forehead would stop. And if I refuse, Hyperseth said, aware of the deceit now. Then you will suffer, Grimelda said, disclosing, disclosing herself to him. She quickly moved inside the etheric enclosure, grabbing the sleeping Megdalen by the throat. Oh, how you'll suffer to see your love in pain. 
she seethed, driven by a dark force she herself couldn't quite understand. The strings of the puppeteer pulling her into exactly where they wanted. Was everyone and everything here in this darkness only available at a price? Hyperseth felt a great sadness for the Badlands and knew... <clears throat> Oh, crap. Sorry. Oh, my throat. Okay, guys, this is where it starts. My throat is getting blocked. Hyperself felt a great sadness. Felt a great sadness for the Badlands and knew that only love could save them all now. He had a plan, but first he would need to break old Linnaeus free from the dark stronghold of Grimelda's grasp. And to do that, he would need to speak to her heart. Hold on here. <laughs> okay, they want me to keep going into chapter 10, which is the key of Madrigal. Old Linnaeus was the first to respond. I'm sorry, old man, he said to Hyperseth, backing away in disgust at his disgrace. But Hyperseth could not hold a grudge, and knowing that old Linnaeus only meant well, spoke to him quickly in the ancient fairy tongue that Hyperseth was certain Grumelda would not understand. Bliarni boaka medorius paraman. He wanted Linnaeus to weave a spell about the space that only he and the fairy could see. The spell was a conjuring of the cherubim and a trick in order to get Grumelda's attention. <laughs> I can't see my words due to my tears. No one had known about her crush on him but Hyperseth himself. He had felt Grimelda every time she had busted into his consciousness with her dithering about how they would make the perfect couple. He had eyes for no one but Megdalen, but the flattery of Grimelda's proposal had not been lost on him. Linnaeus confirmed with a wink and a nod that the cherubim angel was in place right behind Grimelda. It stood ready to place the love note in her heart at the moment that Hyperseth would propose an alliance with her. The angel's arrow of love was a sweet temptation that she wouldn't be able to resist making her forget that Magdalene was even part of the picture. She would be fooled into believing that Hyperseth had done all this for her and their love for each other. Hyperseth knew it was a mean, dirty trick, but it was no worse than Grimelda threatening her own sister's life at the obeyance of the Dark Ones of the Badland. <clears throat> he reminded himself to be kind and would grant her her life if she would only let Magdalene go. This Powerball had everyone betraying each other, and he still wasn't exactly sure of everything it could do. But Hyperseth thought if he could only get it clear of the Badlands, then he could have more time to work with it. The Cherubim had only a moment to act as Grimelda squeezed Magdalene's neck even harder. Sister, Magdalene choked out a plea for her sister's mercy. She had never seen her act this way, and it could only be dark <coughs> magic. Oh, God, okay, yes. Only be dark magic, pushing her on to her own detriment. Grimelda. Hyperseth said, holding out his hand. Love, come here, he said softly, summoning up all the love he felt for Magdalene and sending it into Grimelda's heart. The cherubim acted and a love beam shot out of its heart and into Grimelda's. The dark magic spell broken, if only for a moment, by love's light. What did you say? Grimelda felt funny inside. You called me love, she said, loosening her grip around Magdalene's throat. Yes, love, let's speak for a moment. She knows I'm mad at her. I want to share the plan with you. Stop. The plan, she said. Her dark heart Suddenly overtaken with a feeling she hadn't known in this lifetime, love enveloped her and the dark stranglehold on her countenance lifted. The dark lords of the Badlands lost contact with her, and they wondered what had occurred. 
the love spell so thickly applied that tears shimmered in her eyes now. Love, she said softly as she moved closer to him, her eyes never far from his. She couldn't take her eyes off him. He felt terrible about the, the deceit, but for Magdalene, the Powerball, and every innocent citizen of the Badlands, he must continue. Let me hold you close, darling, he said, holding out his hand. She couldn't resist him. She was so enamored by the grace around him. It only took a moment as the love flowed between them for Linnaeus to step out behind the clearing and use the key. The door between the realms was unlocked, if only for a moment, and as the old fay winked a signal that the barrier was open, Hypersep did the only thing he could think of. Holding Grimelda tightly, so much so that she was enveloped in a flame of desire and love, he looked at Linnaeus and Magdalen. God forgive me, he said, as he quickly pushed Grimelda through the barrier gate and into the light world as the others quickly stepped through. He had, in essence, sealed her fate. She could never return to the land she had always known. She was now an outcast like the rest of them. The light world held their only hope now as the cherubim's spell was broken and the love beam gone. There was only a lost and longing Grimelda Ravenclaw crutching, clutching her heart as she gasped at the lightness of the air in this place. She could never go home again. And in that moment, she thought her life would end. But the life she now knew had only just begun. Uh, what are you chewing? Okay, gotta go over here and parent my animal. Hey, let's go inside. So let me take this indoors with this. Because I want to talk about <laughs> what does that have to do with your solar plexus? What healing is needed as part of 777 to get you to be able to move forward? How do you come out of the lower chakras, all this pain that's been going on, that we've been healing, all of these things that need to take place? We have to go into the heart. But I feel like, come here, I feel like... You know, Hyperseth spoke to Grimelda using love, like a cherubim is an angel and does work with love. But I find it, what I find interesting about it is the deception part of things. So I want to, okay, I've got my little distracted dog out of the way. I just want to sit outside with this for a minute as it pertains to our collective that's here. Uh, when I was pulling a card, so we drew seven or so cards on day one. And when I created a little altar for this 777 journey, uh, I was guided to put a couple of other things there. And one of them was a picture of these morning glories flowers from Green Hope Farm Flower Essences. And it says, our flower essences made here at the farm and in many places all over the world are created in partnership with nature and include special collections for animals as well as people. I find it very interesting that we We've been in the Badlands for the first nine chapters of this book. And at the end of the ninth chapter, or actually it was the end of the 10th, or into the 10th, we move into the light world. And if you were a citizen of the Badlands in this book, in this channeled novel, if you ever tried to leave, then the decree was that you could never go back again, which is a metaphor in and of itself. <laughs> kind of like once you start on this ascension journey, you typically don't. Um, once you pledge yourself as a spiritual hmm, apprentice, you typically don't, re well, there have some, <laughs> been some people that have, but why is she coming up? All right, I don't know why they want me to bring up Doreen Virtue, but... 
you typically don't renounce that and go back again. Because it is a journey of the heart and it's supposed to be about love. Doing what you love, being love, unconditional love. And this morning glory flower speaks to me of like a dawn of a new day and just the fact that it's called Green Hope Farms. Um, and so I just, I feel like this day three is more of a kind of a collective clearing across those who come, come across this. And even if you don't, I think it also has to do with this special time frame that this episode is being recorded. Because work we do has a ripple effect, whether one person hears it, whether I just speak it out loud to the universe and, and, and my soul signature delivers the message as a ripple effect outward, or whether, you know, 10,000 people hear it. There's clearing that happens for you individually, and then there's clearing you do that's more ancestral and beyond ancestral, I think, in this case, it sounds like it's like galactic clearing. And as I was reading the history of, um, I got plugged, I got um, plugged into a couple different little galactic history timelines that I was reading from. Um, one was Debbie Solaris and the other, I can't remember what it was called. I have to go back and find it. It was very interesting. It was kind of a little visual representation. And it's like the soul never dies, right? And as I was reading some of these um, histories of some of the galactic things that have been happening over billions of years, it's I was, you know, looking back towards like the Lyran, like I said, the... Um, draconian wars and I mean that was so freaking long ago and I'm like man I remember that so clearly that lifetime and so it's been <laughs> I've crossed oceans of time just to find you who says that I've crossed oceans of time just to find you that's a quote from a movie so there's this special thing happening with this eclipse that's coming up at the end of the month. And it has to do with several things. One of them is bringing in a new um, streams of abundance and prosperity flows coming through because it's a Taurus eclipse. The other one is bringing in soul family that you, yeah, that's the big one here, that you haven't seen in physical reality for maybe eons and oceans and oceans of time. It doesn't have to be a romantic, it could, you know, it could be a divine union, it could be a, just a soul partnership agreement, like soul family. But it's like soul families coming back together again is a big part of this, um, this eclipse that's coming up and so that energy gets wrapped into this show and I just saw two people on a motorcycle like a guy and a girl on a motorcycle um, and they had helmets on so like space you know motorcycle helmets almost could look like space helmets and these partnerships coming back together again and some of you not seeing each other for oceans and oceans of time and it's like this soul family reunion and I feel deep down many things many metaphors coming out of what was just shared but I want to leave it to you to pick and let your guides show you which ones are meant for you And to let this solar plexus day three be about the anticipation of what's to come, the reunions with 
and the partnerships with someone that you may have last incarnated with, not even on this planet. It could have been somewhere way back during the Draconian Wars or the, you know, Alpha Centauri battles, or I don't know, they're bringing up all these different ones where you got separated because of a fallout, because of some darkness that caused a wedge to come between two souls and souls had to part and then other things kind of took precedence and as souls were separated, you know, and timelines shifted and things changed, reality shifted, you know, you were no longer, it was no longer in the plan in the near future for those souls to come back together again until darkness, internal shadow, as well as external darkness, like we've been clearing off of the planet now for quite some time as part of the organic ascension process. Now, oh, I've got so many chills. Now, with the grids being so clear, coming into the light, it's time for these souls to reunite. Oh, that's a rhyme. Come into the light. Time for these souls to reunite. And it's not, you know, any spell work that you're doing. It's not an inorganic union between two souls. It's part of destiny. It's part of how it always should have been. It's like Adam's rib, they're saying. This is the type of symbiosis that these divine partnerships have with each other. And so as this day three, it's not, it is kind of, there are still some tears shed. Because just when I think like, oh, I'm over the Lyran Wars, it comes back again. It's very, very emotional. It's like a whole friggin' planets were destroyed. It was very catastrophic. And that PTSD and that sorrow and trauma and grief lived deep in the soul's memory banks, for lack of a better word, in the soul's auric field. But I feel like with this coming back, yeah, that's what it is. With these partnerships coming into union again, again, it does, like I said, it does. It could be brothers and sisters, like soul brother, soul sister. It doesn't have to be like, you know, romantic union. But I feel like these unions coming back together again is, number one, reward for all the hard work you've done in not just this lifetime, many lifetimes. And number two... You're just, yeah, there, it's like you're just coming home again. Back to the, how, you know, the, the halcyon days or whatever when you, when everything was fine before your whole friggin' planet got destroyed and you were jettisoned off to somewhere that you had no idea where the heck you were and you were a total refugee. And we can see now that that's, and we're, st we're still not done with that kind of thing based on what's going on in on our planet today. We're still not we're still not over that. We still have a lot of work to do. And I think that's just closing on this note that that's another reason that we're being gifted with these partnerships and unions yet again is there's there's where's Linnaeus McGee? There's magic afoot. There's magic afoot. And there's missions to be accomplished. So you have to, if you listen to this show, you're not just like some, you know, teen, you're not just, you know, some teenager with a crush on some kind of thing. Like you, you can see from a much, you can, okay, it's like Master Co kind of always says, like there's, very, there's different levels of truth and they're all kind of, um, radiate out from each other with the smallest circle kind of being the, like the, I don't want to call it lowest, but the lesser, lesser truth. Um, 
So we could just start with that example, like, oh, I've got a crush on this person. Yes, that's true. <laughs> another, another circle around that, a bigger circle is, oh, I meant to, I meant to, it's, it's, I meant to be with this person or have contact with this person for a certain reason. Yep. Another circle, um, I have a mission. I came to Gaia with a mission and a purpose in this lifetime as well as many others. And together, me and this other person have a mission, a soul mission and a purpose to fulfill as part of the organic ascension process. So all of that's true. But if you are listening to this show, you, you can understand it all. And at the end of the day, you can look at it from many different perspectives. You can get those butterflies in your stomach because of, you know, how much you love and appreciate this person. And you have the magic afoot of the deep remembering that you've known them in other lifetimes. You're going to have deep healing and reunions with family members, soul family members that you haven't seen in, I mean, it's timeless, right? Like it's, it's like the draconian wars, if I just give that as the example, since that's what I've been reading about, were billions of years ago. But in the higher dimensions, there is no time. So when you come into contact with this person again, it's going to be as if no time has passed. And then you're going to get activated to your mission. So the healing here is really just understanding all these different levels of truth. Working with any metaphors that came up for you as from anything that you heard. We heard a lot about dark magic in those two chapters. We heard a lot about um, love's arrow not being so... Um, used in such a way that it, like it was being used in a deceitful way but it was also being used was it deceitful so that's another one level another another level of truth was that deceitful because in a in a way he's saving hyperseth in doing what he did with the angel was saving grimelda from the dark the darkness and moving her into the light world and so can you can you look at that from both perspectives from a divine neutral, neutral perspective or a non-duality kind of a perspective and t like t pick apart that whole scenario right there about what happened and see maybe where you might be holding a grudge somewhere they're talking about holding grudges And then, you know, clear all that, whatever's coming up as a result of anything that you heard, like clear all that crap, you know, that's what we're here doing. That's what we've been doing. Many of you listening to this show are master healers. Ma you know, I know who you are and you're masters at what you do. You have mastered so far. I'm not saying that you've mastered everything, but so far you've mastered what has been given to your soul to learn and align with in this lifetime. And you're, you've gotten, you're getting kudos and recognition from your guides and from source and from Gaia. And you're ready to move into the next part of your soul mission. And, oh crap. Mm. For some of you, it was a mission cut short, like I talked about. Some of you are gonna react very strongly to this bringing up of the draconian wars. Others are gonna react more strongly to the Lemurian fall, the ca ca catastrophes on Gaia that obliterated Mu and that, oh, so many chills there, and again separated you from some of these same unions. The fall of Atlantis, Egypt, uh, any of you that were involved in Egyptian timelines, 
and now <laughs> oh we get another chance yet again these are again these are other circles within circles we get another chance yet again another whole friggin fresh start here we go again can you do your part it's not just you like it's not all on your shoulders but do your part to uplift to do your soul's calling and your soul mission whatever that is for you to help raise the vibration of the planet and to try to move forward to this enlightened state of being that we know we know we can have it on this planet we know we can we can but it's going to take all of us collectively keeping our vibration high. And these unions, these very high vibe partnerships that are coming up are going to raise the light quotient ten tenfold is what they're saying right now. Archangel Metatron saying that these are These missions are very special gifts from source. And I know I try not to take them too seriously. And, you know, on the show, we do a lot of lighthearted, fun stuff. But I think there's just some last bits of this emotional wounding kind of clearing. I say last bits, so we'll see. <laughs> that have to be cleared before these eclipses come up. And so... It is a little bit heavier. And I think from here on out, once we move into the heart space, which is day four, up through the remaining chakras, I think we're gonna have a totally different like um, child's play feel about it. And these lower chakras just really had to be cleaned out and cleared out before we could move on. So that is all we have to share. I wanna thank you all so much for joining me here. And I will look forward to connecting with you again. We'll see you soon for day four of 777. And then we've got Beltane coming up very soon too and the eclipse. So I'm going to see what else we work into the show to bring a little bit of levity <laughs> to it. So I will see you all again soon in the next episode. Take care. This episode has been brought to you by the Pleiadian and Lemurian Councils of Light. We are here to help you raise your vibe. Thank you so much for joining us, star friends and family.